Lives of the Ancient Philosophers by François Fénelon Life of Fénelon, Archbishop of Cambrai This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Francis de Solignac de Le Mont Fénelon, Archbishop of Cambrai, was born in the castle of Fénelon in Perigord on the 6th of August, 1651. His ancestors were equally distinguished for their bravery and their learning, insomuch that his own name was said to be the ninth which had reflected literary honor on the house of Salignac. He had the good fortune to be taken in his childhood under the especial care of his uncle, the Marquis de Fénelon, a nobleman who united in himself the virtues of all his race, and who was pronounced by the great Conde to be equally fitted for the field, for conversation, and for the cabinet. Brought up under the direction of such a character, and sheltered in the bosom of retirement from all society or discourse that could corrupt his tender mind, Fenelon, from his earliest years, gave promise of all the useful talents and mild graces which throughout life distinguished him and rendered him as respected as he was beloved. Having resolved to devote himself to the service of the church, he was sent at twelve years of age to the University of Cowers to commence his studies, which he went to Paris to finish and preached in that city when he was only nineteen years of age, with the greatest success. His uncle, however, though delighted with his youthful eloquence, was too prudent and too truly religious not to tremble at the possibility of his being led away by the applause of men, and tempted to make his discourses, like some in the present day, the vehicles of mere declamation and inflated sentiment. He therefore advised him to observe silence in public and devote his private hours to study and meditation until his knowledge should be matured and he might feel himself qualified to instruct conscientiously in his sacred vocation. Fenelon willingly followed advice of which his own modesty and piety showed him the propriety and devoted himself silently and sedulously to the improvement of his moral and intellectual powers. The two great parties that divided religious opinions at that time in France were the Jesuits and the Jansenists. To the institution of the Jesuits, no other that has yet appeared in civilized society can bear any comparison in point of foresight, depth of design, and energy of action. Never was Lord Bacon's maxim that knowledge is power, more fully exemplified than in the history of these men. Versed in every species of human learning, they derived from it all the consideration which superior information invariably commands. Devoting themselves in all countries more especially to the education of youth, they gained over the minds of their pupils, whilst yet pliant, an influence which continued almost without an exception to the latest hour of their lives. Careless of themselves individually, there were no hardships, no privations they were not willing to undergo, no sacrifices they were not ready to make in order to advance the cause of science in general and to aggrandize their own order in particular. They were dispersed, either openly or in disguise, not only throughout the civilized world, but to the remotest corners of the habitable globe. Embracing all orders and classes of society, their address and acquirements rendered them the most formidable political engine that ever existed, and it was only at last, by grasping at what might be termed absolute power over the human mind, that they lost the influence which, in the first instance, their talents and learning, and contempt of all considerations merely selfish, had deservedly gained. 
Very different were the habits and doctrines of the Jansenists, so called from their founder Jansenius, Bishop of Ypres, who, by plunging into a controversy respecting the nature of grace and free will, not only found no end in wandering mazes lost, but laid the foundation of a dispute respecting inexplicable terms which continued throughout two centuries, convulsing at intervals both the church and state of France to their very centers. Among the Jansenists, the house of Arnaud stood conspicuous. One of that family was abbess of Port Royal, a convent situated in a solitary, uncultivated tract of land in the neighborhood of Paris, more resembling a desert than anything could have been expected to appear so immediately in the vicinity of one of the gayest capitals in Europe. Several of this lady's relations were also members of this community. The celebrated Anthony d'Arnaud, the two Le Maitre, Le Sassy, and several other persons of rank and talent retired to the same spot and spent their whole time in prayer and study. The writings of many of the illustrious solitaries of Port Royal are to be reckoned among the ablest compositions in the French language, but unfortunately they devoted their contemplations too exclusively to themes of a merely speculative nature. Of providence, foreknowledge, will, and fate, fixed fate, free will, and knowledge absolute, and their sentiments too often betrayed the gloom into which unsatisfied inquiry always plunges the mind. The mildness of Fenelon's disposition and the sweetness of his views respecting the nature and attributes of the eternal creator of all things rendered the discouraging doctrines and immoderate severity of the Jansenists particularly disagreeable to him. With the Jesuits, on the contrary, he was much pleased and remained attached to them throughout life, won by their courtesy, their learning, and their active benevolence. Nevertheless, he joined himself to the Sulpicians, a community of secular priests who, far inferior in renown either to the Jesuits or Jansenists, yet commanded universal respect by the unassuming piety with which they devoted their exertions to the service of the Church, in her most obscure and humble functions, within which modest and useful line of duty they uniformly confined their efforts. After continuing his studies for some time under the Abbé Tronçon, prior of the convent of Saint-Sulpice, Fenelon was ordained priest in that seminary, in his twenty-fourth year, and passed the three following years in complete retirement. He then, at the desire of the curate of the parish of Saint-Sulpice, began to deliver a course of familiar explanations of the Old and New Testaments on Sundays and festivals, and these first made him known to the public. He was, shortly afterwards, appointed confessor and spiritual director to a community of females who had been gained over from the Protestant to the Catholic faith, and about the same time he formed an intimacy with the celebrated Bossuet, the most eloquent of French, or perhaps of any orator of modern times, and with the Abbé de Fleury, a man as distinguished for the endowments of his mind as the purity of his manners. In the unreserved society of these persons, Fenelon passed at this juncture many of his happiest hours, strengthening his piety by their precepts and his virtues by their example. Fenelon had entertained thoughts, in the beginning of his religious career, of transporting himself to Canada and devoting his life to the conversion of the savages but the delicate state of his health, rendering it improbable that he would be able to bear the rigor of so severe a climate, he changed his determination and resolved to dedicate himself to the missions of the East. Soon, however, 
a field was opened to him at home for his utmost labors by the short-sighted bigotry of Louis the Fourteenth. That monarch, on the 23rd of August, 1685, absolutely and entirely revoked the Edict of Nantes, by which Henry the Fourth granted to the Huguenots, or Protestants, the free exercise of their religion, and placed them nearly on a level in equality of civil rights with his other subjects. These unfortunate persons, now seeing themselves exposed to every species of persecution and insult, quitted France by thousands, and dispersing themselves in the different Protestant states, enriched them with their arts and industry, whilst they at the same time taught them to execrate the tyranny by which they were eventually to be benefited. The success with which Fenelon had acquitted himself of the duties of his office as a Catholic priest, in all matters where Protestants or newly made converts were concerned, made Louis desirous of securing his services towards gaining over such Huguenots as still remained in the kingdom. The province of Poitou was appointed for the scene of his labors. Before he entered upon them, he was presented to Louis. The king desired him to state any wishes that he might entertain connected with his mission. The only request he made was that the troops and every species of military parade might be removed far from the province of which he was to have the direction. Violence and persecution of any description whatsoever were not only odious but sinful in the eyes of Fenelon. Sincerity and love were his weapons, and with these arms alone he won to his way of thinking many whom no dangers could have terrified from their original faith, whilst, on the contrary, other hapless provinces were desolated with fire and sword, without being able, in a single instance, to shake the firmness of the wretched sufferers, who nobly sacrificed both property and life, rather than assent with their lips to doctrines which they could not believe in their hearts. The principles on which Fenelon acted himself, he labored to impart more especially to those who were likely one day to have dominion over others. To Prince Charles, the son of James the Second, better known by the name of the Pretender, he earnestly recommended toleration in religious matters, should he ever be restored to the throne of his ancestors. No human power, said he, can force the impenetrable entrenchments of the freedom of the mind. Compulsion never persuades, it only makes hypocrites. When kings interfere in matters of religion, they enslave instead of protecting it. Give civil liberty to all, not by approving all religions as indifferent, but by patiently permitting what God permits, and by endeavoring to teach persons a right mode of thinking by mildness and persuasion. Soon after the return of Fenelon from his successful mission into Poitou, he was appointed preceptor to the Duke of Burgundy, the Duke of Anjou, and the Duke of Berry, the three sons of the Dauphin. Fenelon entered upon his important office with religious solicitude. Regarding the happiness of millions as connected with the dispositions of his pupils, the training them to virtue, and especially forming the character of the eldest, who was destined one day to ascend the throne of France, became the subject of his most anxious thoughts, his noblest ambition. The Duke of Burgundy was one of those singular beings who appear equally qualified by nature for the most exalted virtue or the most degraded vice, and whose bias depends entirely on the hand by which it may be given. At the time that Fenelon undertook the direction of him, it must be acknowledged that the preponderance turned towards all that was unpromising. The Duke of Burgundy, says the Duke de Saint-Simon in his memoirs, was born terrible, 
and during his first years continued to be an object of terror to those around him. Hard-hearted, angry to the extreme of passion, even against inanimate objects, impetuous to a degree of fury, incapable of bearing the least opposition to his wishes, even from time or climate, without putting himself into paroxysms of rage that made one tremble for his existence, a condition in which I have often seen him, stubborn in the highest degree, insatiable in the pursuit of every kind of pleasure, addicted to the gratifications of the table and violent hunting, delighted to a degree of ecstasy with music and with deep play in which, however, he could not bear to lose, and by his violence made it dangerous to anyone to engage with him. In fine, abandoned to all the passions, and transported by every kind of enjoyment, often ferocious, naturally cruel, barbarous in his raillery, seizing the ridiculous with astonishing justness, high as the clouds in his own opinion, considering other men as atoms to which he bore no resemblance, and regarding even his brothers, though educated on an equality with himself, only as intermediate beings between him and the rest of the human race. Such is the picture of this prince, by one who was personally acquainted with him from his cradle. Happily, his talents bore full proportion to his faults, and, under the exquisite discernment and judicious tenderness of Fénélon, who felt an almost parental attachment for his royal pupil, and whose plans were fully entered into and aided by his coadjutors, the Abbé de Fleury, the Abbé de Langeron, and Father Le Valois, the prince gradually became all that could be wished. From the abyss which I have described, says Saint-Simon, there arose a prince, affable, gentle, moderate, patient, modest, humble, austere only to himself, attentive to his duties, and sensible of their great extent. His only object appeared to be to acquit himself of all that might be expected of him as a son and subject, and to qualify himself for his future obligations. To relate the means by which Fénélon accomplished so extraordinary and desirable a change in the moral nature of his pupil, at the same time that he stored his mind with every species of information, would be to relate a complete system of education, one of the most fortunate that ever was attempted. But in the present brief memoir, the detail would be too minute. The great secret, after all, of Fénélon's success was his own worth. His learning, his piety, his sincerity, his disinterestedness, and his independence joined to perfect consistency of conduct on all occasions, commanded respect. His sweetness, his benevolence, the courtesy of his demeanor, the tenderness of his feelings, the warmth of his affections, the poetical cast of his imagination, stored with the most delightful images, all inspired love. He corrected the faults of his pupil and cherished his virtues by the same means. He perpetually delineated his portrait, under whatever aspect it might appear, in a series of the most interesting fables. Self-love taught the Duke to seek for their very inmost meaning. Self-love taught him at first to correct the faults which, when written down, he could not bear to contemplate and the powerful bond of habit once broken through, better feelings taught him to preserve that victory over himself for conscience's sake, which in the first instance he had attempted only for the admiration of those around him. Fenelon now began to reap the harvest in a worldly point of view of all his excellencies. His success in the education of his pupils particularly in that of the Duke of Burgundy, had rendered his name renowned throughout the kingdom, 
and his conciliating manners had obtained him the personal regard of all who knew him. Louis the Fourteenth presented him to the Abbey of saint Valery, one of the richest in France, and afterwards named him Archbishop of Cambrai. He was consecrated in the chapel of Saint-Cyr, in the presence of Madame de Maintenon and his three royal pupils, and presented the rare spectacle of merit rewarded, without envy or malice endeavoring to subtract from its deserts. The time was, however, rapidly approaching, when the very virtues of Fenelon were to lead him into misfortune. In every age of Christianity there have always existed some individuals, among different denominations of Christians, who have aimed at a sublime spirituality above visible objects and natural feelings, and attempted by assiduous prayer and abstraction from terrestrial things, to raise themselves to an intellectual contemplation of the Deity, and a sensible communion with Him. Among them may particularly be distinguished the quietists, as they called themselves, from their considering a state of calm contemplativeness and passive abandonment of themselves to the divine will as the highest pitch of wisdom and virtue. These people increased so rapidly towards the end of the 16th century under the influence of Michael de Molinos, a Spanish priest, who resided at Rome, that they drew down upon themselves the censures of the Pope, and suffered much persecution in consequence. Their doctrines were, for some time after, kept greatly out of sight, or at least expressed in very guarded language. The open revival of them in the reign of Louis the Fourteenth originated with Madame de Gaillon, a lady descended from a respectable family, in possession of an ample fortune, and gifted by nature with all that is most lovely and most captivating in the female form and mind. Left a widow very early in life, her morals remained to her dying day without reproach, notwithstanding the endeavors of her enemies to throw odium upon them. Having placed herself under the spiritual direction of Father Lacomte, who had been a disciple of Molinos, she became tinctured with his views, and having composed two works in illustration of them, she traversed great part of France, making everywhere friends and proselytes with inconceivable rapidity. At length she arrived in Paris, and her graces and her eloquence soon procured her admittance to the private parties at the Hôtel de Beauvilliers, where Madame de Maintenon used to dine once or twice a week with the Duc de Beauvilliers, one of the most estimable noblemen France ever knew, his wife, a daughter of the celebrated Colbert, and their own immediate connections. All ceremony and pomp were banished from these social and intellectual meetings. The court was excluded from them. Fenelon alone was admitted, a constant and a valued guest. In him, Madame de Guillon found a willing hearer. She descanted before him on the pure and abstract love of God for his own perfection, and the exquisite bliss of a soul absorbed in the contemplation of his goodness, and resigned to his will, and removed alike from all considerations of hope or fear. She touched a nerve of exquisite sensibility in her hearer, and it vibrated through his heart, which glowed within him as she spoke. Doctrines, sublime and peaceful in themselves, promulgated by a female of the first endowments, sanctioned by a man so eminent as Fenelon, and received by Madame de Maintenon in the zenith of her power, all but the acknowledged consort of the King of France, doctrines with such advantages could not fail of becoming popular. The court itself soon exhibited the singular spectacle of an assemblage of fashionable contemplatists waiting for pious ecstasies and beatific visions. The clergy became alarmed at the prospect 
of a religion being diffused, which struck at the root of all forms and ceremonies. They pronounced it a dangerous innovation, chimerical in theory, subversive in practice of the true spirit of religion, and leading indirectly to a frightful laxity of morals. The bigotry of Madame de Maintenon took the alarm at such a representation, and from that time she openly professed herself the enemy of quietism and of Madame de Guillon. Fenelon, however, remained unshaken in his attachment to both, and was in consequence involved in a controversy of the most afflicting nature, insomuch as he had in it for his bitterest opponent his venerable friend Bossuet, to whom he had for years looked up with almost filial reverence. It would swell this memoir too much to enter into a minute examination of the merits of a dispute which, though for eighteen months retaining complete possession of the public mind throughout France and the Papal States, is now never alluded to or thought of, excepting to show to how much persecution a good man may be unjustly exposed, and how much his goodness will enable him to endure without repining. In defense of Madame de Guillon, Fenelon had written the Maxims of the Saints, consisting chiefly of extracts from the writings of the early fathers, respecting what is termed among the mystics the interior life. This book, though abounding with the sublimest thoughts, drew down upon its author the heaviest indignities. The wish to place the doctrines of the quietists in a candid point of view was confounded with an attempt to vindicate all the errors and absurdities into which too literal an acceptation of them might lead. Fenelon was banished, notwithstanding the tears of the Duke of Burgundy, who threw himself at the feet of his grandfather the king, entreating him not to send away his beloved preceptor. The royal displeasure was extended to everyone who bore the name of Fenelon, or claimed consanguinity or friendship with him. The Pope himself, though sitting in judgment at that time on the theological opinions of Fenelon, was shocked at the severity with which he was treated, and exclaimed to himself with great emotion when he heard of it, Expulerunt nepotim, expulerunt consanguineos, expulerunt amicos. His nephew, his relations, his friends, they have turned them all out of doors. In ecclesiastical language, to be banished simply means to confine a bishop to his diocese, exactly the place where he ought to be, according to honest Martin Luther, who says, bishop means by the sheep, signifying that one in that sacred office ought never to be far from his flock. It was well for Fenelon that he placed his greatest happiness in being among the people of his pasture. His banishment to Cambrai was no banishment to him, excepting as his friends were involved in his disgrace. He had suffered two years to elapse without paying a second visit to court, after the first, where he had been received by Louis with the highest marks of favor on his return from the province of Poitou. He, who could voluntarily observe an absence of that duration, was not likely to be affected by one much longer, which was not of his own seeking. Whilst Fenelon was employed at Cambrai in the discharge of every duty of his sacred office and the exercise of every virtue that could throw a holy radiance over the human character, the storm still raged from without. He was attacked on all sides, chiefly by Bossuet. Opinions were imputed to him which he had never entertained. He was compelled to exonerate himself from them for the honor of religion itself. He took up his pen reluctantly, but it was tipped with fire, and wrought conviction in the hearts of his readers. At length, his wrongs and mortifications reached their height. The Pope, evidently against his will, if not against his judgment, 
but goaded on by the careless importunities of Louis the Fourteenth, who felt the simplicity of Fenelon's faith and the purity of his life, a reproof to his own conduct in both matters, at last pronounced sentence of condemnation against the maxims of the saints, and particularly against twenty-three of the propositions contained in it, as liable to give offence to pious ears, erroneous in doctrine, and pernicious in practice. It was now that the character of Fenelon appeared in its loveliest light. He who, to use the language of the Chancellor d'Aguesseau in a speech which President Hainaut styles an eternal honour to his memory, he who had fought like a lion in defence of his work, whilst there was a chance of victory, or even of not being conquered, submitted in an instant, like the lowliest sheep of his flock. So implicitly did this admirable prelate bow before the reproof of him whom he acknowledged as the head of the church, reading it himself in his diocese, along with his own recantation, that his enemies would willingly have spread the idea that his acknowledgment of error was too prompt to be sincere, but the general tenor of his character made it far more improbable that it should be otherwise. The dislike of Louis the Fourteenth towards Fenelon was greatly increased by the publication of the celebrated romance of Telemachus, written by the archbishop expressly for the instruction of the Duke of Burgundy. The pure morality of this work, the beauty of its descriptions, the tenderness of its sentiments, joined to its high tone of feeling, gave it an irresistible charm in the eyes of all impartial judges, and its merits were universally acknowledged by being translated into every language in Europe. But to the court it presented a very different picture. They saw in it only a satire on their royal master and themselves. Calypso was supposed to be the Marchioness de Montespan. Eucharis, Mademoiselle de Fontange. Telemachus, the Duke of Burgundy. Mentor, the Duke of Beauvilliers. Antiope, the Duchess of Burgundy. Protesilos, Louvois, Idomeneus, our King James the Second, and Sesostris, Louis the Fourteenth. Hence, fresh indignities were shown to Fenelon, and stabs were aimed at him in every part where he was thought most vulnerable. But with respect to injuries that affected himself alone, he might indeed be said to bear a charmed life, and long after he had felt the full measure of the haughty Bourbon's unrelenting hate, he put an apology for the faults of kings into the mouth of Mentor, which appeared in a subsequent edition of Telemachus. To follow Fenelon into what the world might term retirement, and deem synonymous with disgrace, is to follow him into the field of his most sacred duties, and the scene of his purest happiness. When he acquiesced in his nomination to the Archbishopric of Cambrai, it was on the express condition that he should be allowed to reside nine months out of twelve in his diocese. The permission, therefore, to remain there constantly, however ungracious the form in which it might be conveyed, was not in itself likely to be unpleasing to him. How much more fortunate would have been our lot he had said to Bossuet in one of his replies to his venerable and powerful antagonist, if instead of thus consuming our time in interminable disputes, we had been employed in our diocese, in teaching the catechism, and instructing the villager to fear God and bless his holy name. Fully did he prove the sincerity with which this was expressed, by the zeal with which he acted up to it. For fifteen years he lived in his diocese, the blessing of all who came within his influence. He rose early, spent the first part of the morning in devotion, and the remainder of it he gave to the spiritual instruction of those who came before him. At noon he dined. 
His table was spread with an elegance and plenty suitable to his rank, but his own diet was spare and simple. He said grace himself both before and after dinner, with seriousness, but without affectation. His tried friend, the virtuous and faithful Abbe de Chantoral, a relation with whom he had long lived in the closest habits of friendship, and to whom he had entrusted the advocating of his cause at home, was invariably seated at his right hand. He admitted all his chaplains to his table, and on all occasions treated them with that respect himself which he wished to see them receive from others. The discourse during dinner was general, and strangers were struck with its ease and politeness. No person, says the Duke de Saint-Simon, ever possessed in a higher degree than Fenelon the happy talent of easy, light, and ever-decent conversation. It was perfectly enchanting. His mild uniform piety troubled no one, and was respected by all. No one felt his superiority. He placed everyone on the same level with himself. Those who left him for a moment were impatient to return to him. After dinner, the company retired to a large apartment, where they continued the conversation for about an hour, whilst Fenelon occasionally signed papers that required dispatch or gave directions to his chaplains on the affairs of his diocese. He then retired to himself until nine o'clock, when he supped. At ten, the whole of his household assembled. One of his chaplains said prayers for the night. When they were concluded, the archbishop rose and gave his general blessing to the assembly, and this solemn rite closed a day of virtuous occupation and rational enjoyment. The only recreation Fenelon ever allowed himself was walking in his garden or in the country. Amidst the beauties of nature, he found his mind refreshed after the toils of business or of study, and his piety invigorated. The country, says he in one of his letters, delights me. In the midst of it, I find the holy peace of God. Oh, what excellent company is God! With him one is never alone, in these walks he often joined the peasants, sat down on the grass with them, talked to them, comforted them, went into their cottages, placed himself at table with their families, and partook of their meals. The laboring peasantry were at all times the objects of his tenderest regard. His palace at Cambrai, with all his books and writings being consumed by fire, he bore the misfortune with unruffled calmness, and said it was better that his palace should be burnt to the ground than the cottage of a poor peasant. A curate complained once to him that his parishioners, notwithstanding his remonstrances, would dance on Sunday evenings after the service was over, as is the custom in Catholic countries. "'My dear friend,' replied Fenelon, "'neither you nor I should dance.' but let us leave these poor people to dance as they please. Their hours of happiness are not too numerous. At the time that Cambrai was often ravaged by advancing and retreating armies during the contest for the Spanish succession, he one evening met a young man in great affliction on account of the loss of a favorite cow, which was, moreover, the sole support of his numerous family. Fenelon gave him money to purchase another, but the poor fellow could not cease weeping for the cow which his wife had milked and his children loved, and which he feared had fallen into the hands of the enemy. Fenelon spoke comfort to him, and pursued his way, but soon after parting with him he saw a cow which, from the description he had received of it, he knew to be the same that was so bitterly lamented and, thinking only of the joy that the sight of it again would give to the disconsolate little circle to which it belonged, he drove it back himself, in a dark night, to the young man's cottage. This, says the Cardinal de Maury, 
is perhaps the finest trait in Fenelon's life. Woe to those who read it without being affected. No wonder that, with such feelings and such actions, Fenelon should have been beloved as well as revered by the poor, and that long after his death they should show the wooden chair on which he used to sit when he visited them, and weep to think that they should see his face no more. It was not only by his own people and his own countrymen that Fenelon was thus esteemed. The Englishmen, Germans, and Dutch, whilst their troops occupied Cambrai, all rivaled the inhabitants in tokens of veneration for him. He visited every part of his diocese in as much security as if it had been at perfect rest. All distinctions of religion and sect, says Monsieur de Bosset, all feelings of hatred or jealousy which divide nations disappeared in his presence. He was often obliged to have recourse to artifice to avoid the honors which the armies of the enemy intended him. He refused the military escorts which were offered him for his personal security in the exercise of his functions, and, without any other attendance than a few ecclesiastics, he traversed the countries desolated by war. His way was marked by his alms and benefactions, and by the suspension of the calamities which armies bring. In these short visits, the people breathed in peace, so that his pastoral visits might be termed the truce of God. The afflictions inseparable from war called forth the exercise of all Fenelon's noblest qualities. Charity, says the Duc de Saint-Simon, was among his most striking virtues. It embraced equally the rich and the poor, his friends and his enemies. He found frequent call for the exertion of it in the crowds of sick and wounded, who, during the wars in Flanders, were carried in great numbers to Cambrai. He regularly visited the hospitals, paid the utmost attention to the subaltern officers, and lodged a considerable number of the principal officers, when they were ill, in his own palace. Like a true shepherd of Christ, he watched continually over their spiritual welfare. The polished manners which he derived from his habits of high life won them to him and they never had reason to repent of the confidence they reposed in him. In sickness or in health, they always found him willing to listen to their humble confessions, and anxious to replace them in the path of virtue. If the lowest person in the hospital requested his attendance, Fenelon never refused to go to him. The corporeal necessities of the soldiers were equally an object of his compassionate zeal, Broths, meat, medicines, comfortable food of every description, and always of the best kind, were sent them in well-regulated plenty from his palace, and he presided at the consultations of the physicians with the tender solicitude of a warm and generous friend. It is impossible to conceive how greatly he became the idol of the military, and how Versailles, in spite of her stern master, resounded with his name. It happened that the commissariat was in extreme want of corn for the troops. The archbishop emptied his granaries for their subsistence, and refused any remuneration. Even Louis himself, on that occasion, became his panegyrist. His charity and polite attentions extended equally to the prisoners of war as to his countrymen. In all he did, there was an indescribable propriety. The true episcopal character appeared in it, and virtue herself became more beautiful from Fenelon's manner of being virtuous. To the war, Fenelon was indebted for the great gratification of seeing once more his beloved pupil, the Duke of Burgundy. Louis XIV gave, in 1702, the command of the troops in Flanders to that prince, who petitioned him with so much earnestness to be allowed, on his way to the army, to see Fenelon, that the monarch, ashamed perhaps of refusing a request so laudable in itself, 
consented on the express condition that their interview should be in public. The duke apprised his beloved preceptor of the permission, in a letter that breathed the liveliest sentiments of gratitude and esteem. The meeting took place at a public dinner at the town house of Cambrai, but the number of eyes that were fixed upon them, the consciousness they felt that every word they uttered was liable to be repeated and perhaps misrepresented, and the wearisome restraints to which the etiquette of a formal assembly subjected them, rendered this interview of little effect, excepting as far as the eloquence of looks and the sacred sympathy that exists between souls of kindred excellence drew them together. The Duke took care, nevertheless, to testify to all present the esteem in which he held the Archbishop, who, when dinner was over, presented him with a napkin to wipe his hands. The Duke received it, and then returned it to him, saying, in a voice sufficiently elevated to be heard throughout the whole room, I am sensible, my lord Archbishop, what I owe to you, and you know what I am. This preceptor, so valuable, so independent, this pupil, so grateful and so docile, never met again, excepting once for a short time, but their correspondence was a treasure of profound advice on one side, and of willingness and aptness to profit by it on the other. The April after this interview had taken place between Fenelon and the Duke of Burgundy, the death of the Dauphin brought the Duke forward as the immediate heir to the throne of France, and the important situation in which he stood obliging him to make an effort and throw off the reserve in which he had before veiled his virtues and his acquirements, the delighted nation saw in the graceful and engaging young man who was one day to rule over them the complete model of everything that could be desired in a sovereign. It may easily be imagined that Fenelon, the acknowledged favorite of a prince so beloved, soon experienced the different light in which he was now viewed at court. He remained in his beloved retirement as usual, but the voice of flattery pierced his retreat on all sides, though it made no impression on his ear, and his levy at Cambrai was crowded by the very courtiers who, at Versailles, had been the first to abandon his interests. Unfortunately, the Duke of Burgundy was not permitted to realize the lofty hopes his excellencies had inspired. He died in 1712, regretted by the whole kingdom, but above all by Fenelon, who lost in him the dearest object of his earthly affections. A loss, however, to which he submitted with such pious resignation, that amidst the tears of anguish which it drew forth from the frailty of afflicted nature, he exclaimed, Would only moving a straw restore him to life? I would not do it, as it is the divine pleasure that he should die. The eyes of this lamented young prince were scarcely closed when his grandfather, the king, ordered his papers to be brought him, and, having examined them with great attention, he burned them all with his own hands. Among them perished all the noble and disinterested effusions of Fenelon to his pupil, excepting one important production entitled Directions for the Conscience of a King, which, happening to be in the hands of the Duc de Beauvilliers, escaped the flames. Its merits, however, rendered it criminal in the eyes of the court of Versailles, and it was not until the reign of Louis the Sixteenth that leave could be obtained for it to be printed at Paris. Two years after the death of his beloved pupil, Fenelon himself expired at Cambrai, of an inflammation of the chest, in the sixty-fifth year of his age. He died as he had lived, full of humility and love, lamented by all who had known him, and exemplifying the mean he had always observed between prodigality and avarice, by leaving behind him neither debts nor money. 
The remembrance of his virtues was all he had to bequeath to his relatives and friends, and the example of them had been so efficacious in his lifetime that all who bore his name or were admitted into intimacy with him were eminent for their good and honorable qualities. In person, Fenelon was tall and graceful. His eyes beamed with intense and holy radiance. His countenance exhibited marks of severe study, but was likewise distinguished by a peculiar delicacy of expression and correspondence of one feature with another. Like his manners, it combined the most opposite traits of character, but none of them contradicted the other. He appeared alternately the doctor in divinity, the bishop, and the nobleman. In conversation he was eloquent, yet always natural, full of wit, with judgment to proportion it exactly in the degree in which it might be pleasing to the parties to whom it was addressed, and possessing a singular talent of expressing intelligibly the most abstruse ideas. As a preacher, he was zealous to inform and patient to amend. As a writer, he charmed by the grandeur and delicacy of his sentiments, the fertility of his genius, the correctness of his taste, and above all by his exquisite sensibility. Next to Telemachus, his principal work is his Dialogues on Eloquence in general and on that of the pulpit in particular. His letters are likewise exquisitely touching and abound with profound and delicate observations. His demonstrations of the existence of a god is fraught with piety and eloquence, and his thoughts on the education of daughters is written with all the feeling which was so constituent a feature in his disposition, and all the knowledge of the female character which his situation of confessor to a community of that sex had particularly enabled him to acquire. His theological works are only partially interesting in the present day, being chiefly his arguments in defense of quietism and his controversies with the Jansenists. But his Dialogues of the Dead and his Abridgment of the Lies of the Ancient Philosophers, written as well as his Telemachus, expressly for the instruction of the Duke of Burgundy, will always be regarded as lessons fraught with good sense and instruction in the most delightful form. Respecting the lives of the ancient philosophers as accompanying this memoir, a few remarks may not be misplaced. When it first made its appearance, though under the modest title of an abridgment, and indeed to be considered as a masterly sketch rather than a finished work, it yet made the public acquainted in the most agreeable manner with a body of valuable information before accessible only to the learned. In this respect, time has no way lessened its worth. Many more elaborate works on the same subject have appeared, but not one wherein such treasures of wisdom are offered in so concise a form. Every page is fraught with curious facts and valuable truths. The philosophers of modern times can bring scarcely any observation into the field of morality but what has been made before them by the illustrious men whose lives are given in the ensuing pages, and in seeking for our information at the fount of the ancients, we have a chance at least of drinking from a spring unpolluted by envy or misrepresentation. In offering, therefore, a new translation of Fenelon's Lives of the Ancient Philosophers to the public, we seek only for that need of approbation which is due to everyone who, in a reading age like the present, endeavors to render productions which combine instruction and amusement accessible to all ranks of the community by presenting them in a form cheap, portable, and pleasing.